One. English. Are you currently a Time Warner cable customer? Yes. Do you want help with your account? Yes. Did you say you want to add a landline? Representative. All of our representatives are busy. Please hold for the next available representative. <sighs> Thank you for calling Time Warner Cable. This is Jonathan. May I have your account number, please? Okay. It's one six one nine. Please hold while I look up the first half of your account number. Oh yeah, that that doesn't make any sense. Can, please don't don't leave me. Hello. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> Come on, God. Hello? <laughs> Come on, God. Can anybody relate to that? It is true. Yeah. It, it, there was actually a survey done uh, about the most hated time wasters. I, I'm going to do a countdown, the top three. Number three, most hated time waster in America is waiting on a package to be delivered. Number two, most hated time waster is waiting for a new bank card to be delivered. But the number one, you got it, being put on hold on the phone. Does anyone like that? I mean, it's, it's torture, it's torture. So we're, we're talking about this theme as we uh, talk about this series, <clears throat> Promises, 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 God's Faithful Covenant. Last week, we, uh, we talked about uh, Abraham, and we're gonna talk about that again in a minute. In a minute. Uh, God gave promises in the scriptures. He gave amazing promises, huge promises, and then he put it all on hold, a major hold. And uh, you know, I, I know, I know what that's like. But let me read, let me read for you the promise that God made to Ab <clears throat> to Abraham, and then we're going to move into talking about Moses in a minute. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 2 through 7, it says, But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can you give me, how, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant of my household will be my heir. So the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And now remember, Abraham is... 99 years old. So this is a really big deal. Then he took him outside and he did something sort of like an object lesson. He said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can even count them. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. This is a childless father, which was a humiliating status in the ancient Near East. And He's 99 years old, so what are the chances that he's going to, his wife is, is old, and what are the chances he's going to have kids, and God is saying, look up at the sky, look at all the stars, you can't even count them, Those, that's your descendants. Huge promise being offered to Abraham. And then it goes on, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Huge promises, covenant that is being made with Abraham here. Promises, very simply, are divided into two different categories. The promise of a people and the promise of a place. The promise that he's going to not only have only a kid, he's going to have a... All people are going to emanate from Abraham, children of Abraham, and here we are. Count the stars. <clears throat> but also a place. Promise of a place. And it, was, it ends up being called the promised land, Right? a place, a promise, and then after this amazing gift that's bowed and wrapped and it's placed in front of Abraham and Sarah, what does God do? He puts it on hold. You know what that's like in different ways. I know what it's like. Um, some of you know the story about my, the history of my wife and me. Back in junior high school, we were boyfriend-girlfriend. We go back to junior high school. And we were, uh, it, it was a little scary how serious we were about one another back then. We actually talked about marriage. It sounds a little silly to talk about it back then. And then she dumped me for a senior high boy. <laughs> true story, true story. 30 years later, we got married. She put me on hold, guys. That's a long time to wait. 
but it does not compare to what God did with Abraham and all of his descendants. And I want to show that to you in the next text. It's in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 14. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And then they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. No, wait. You give me this promise, you raise my hopes, and then you say, not only is it going to take 400 years for this to come true, but we're going to be slaves that entire time? What gives, God? You ever been there? 400 years. Oh, here's a little caveat. But I will punish the nation that ser- you ser- they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. Yeah, but you got to wait for 400 years and I got to be a slave. Not great news. That's what Abraham died with. The promise not fulfilled, put on hold. Now there's a really, really important takeaway for us right at the outset before we even get to Moses, who is our main figure today. And this is it for you and for me. Just because God's timing is not your timing does not mean that God has forgotten you or his promises to you or for you. Are you with me? God's timing is not your timing and not my timing. We don't like it. We don't understand it. But God's promises are certain. And the reason he gives us these stories and the reason I believe for you and me today that he took 400 years, which seems absolutely absurd, is for us to know that today when we feel like God is absent, when God is not showing up with his promises intact, he actually is. We can trust him. I don't understand God's timing. I can't explain it. God's ways are not my ways or your ways, but God clearly uses time. God clearly uses history, different people, different contexts, different cultures to work out his will in his own way, to deliver on his promises. I don't get the 400 year bit, the slavery bit. I don't know what the answer is, but I love, there's a saying that's, pro, that's passed down through the ancient rabbis, and this is it. It kind of gets at it. The mills of God grind slowly. The mills of God grind slowly. We know that, don't we? Sometimes we just think, you're God. Why don't you just, like, in a blink of an eye, everything could be perfect. Why does God not do that? There, if God is God and God knows what's best, which by definition God does and is, then there has to be a reason behind it. I want to give you a verse. This may be the only thing you latch on to today. This might be life-giving for you. This comes out of the New Testament. And I think this really does answer that question. This is in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And here's how it goes. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness. Now, here's the key. Instead, he is patient with you. He is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What you and I interpret as slowness from our vantage point is really divine patience. There's a difference. Do you know this? We are are so conditioned by our expectations for everything to be instant, fast, automatic, and it serves us our way on our time that we interpret anything that doesn't align with our expectations as slowness. But God is saying, you know, I'm not slow. I'm patient. And my patience is born out of my deep love for you that you might get it that I might get you. I'm going to work with you over time and I have infinite patience that you don't have. So just hang on. Just hang on. So they do. 400 years passes and Moses comes onto the scene finally. Now Moses, remember, he's a Hebrew. He's a part of this slavery. He's not a slave, but he's, a, he's connected to them uh, in his heritage. But he's adopted into the house of Pharaoh, raised as an Egyptian. So he's raised as an Egyptian in royalty, but he's a Hebrew. Quite an interesting mix. He eventually is used by God, and I don't know why God does it, but God obviously needed to have someone in that unique position to be able to know both sides of the equation and to eventually come to Pharaoh and make the demand, let my people go. 
And then he leads them out of Egypt. You know the story, the Exodus, through the Red Sea. They're in the desert. For the first time in 400 years, they have a life, like literally. They're not slaves any longer. They have to figure out how to live together, how to be a community, how to be human. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, leads them to Mount Sinai. Moses is up on the mountain and he's receiving the Ten Commandments, not as a way to diminish life, but as a way of liberating them finally, giving structure, order, and meaning and purpose to life. And this is the way, the way that it goes in Exodus chapter 24. This is that encounter. Moses is up on the mountaintop. The Lord said to Moses, <clears throat> come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments that I have written for their instruction. And Moses set out with Joshua, his aide, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait for, wait for us until we come back to you. Aaron and her are with you, and anyone involved in dispute can go to them. Now, if you're a parent, you, you should automatically be suspicious of that. Kids, we're going to the store. Keep it together until we get back. We'll be back in a minute. What happens? You come back and chaos. Well, it'll happen. You just wait. But before that happens, here's what goes on with Moses. Moses went up to the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day, the Lord called out to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud and he went up on the mountain. And he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights. Now, as a way of understanding what's going on with Moses and this whole covenant making that God is doing here through the giving of the Ten Commandments, I want to review a little bit about where we've been. And I have a, a couple of charts to kind of remind you of that we've been using. This is, this is sort of the idea of what God has done, is doing, and will do. This is a walk through the Bible. This is a walk through life, past, present, and future. This is a, a, a little chart that helps us understand God's ways through making covenants, making promises, he started with creation, making the beautiful, perfect creation. All was well. Nothing was wrong. No pain, no death, no brokenness, no heartache, no anything bad. And he had a covenant with creation. And there's this covenant pattern in creation that we call heaven today, don't we? When all is well, when everything is brought back together. And so there's this pattern that was broken and the, the sort of dotted line is the brokenness, the fallenness, the sin that came into the world. And ever since then, God has been about making covenants with individuals to ultimately redeem us. They all equal the covenant of redemption that lead to Jesus. And so God takes his time, works with Noah, works with Abraham. 400 years between Abraham and Moses. You, you don't see that just looking, but now we have 400 years elapsed to finally get to Moses, to get to Joshua and David and then Jesus. Go ahead and show the next slide. And, and so we know that there are themes that are associated with this, the covenant pattern with creation. We know that with Noah, it was a covenant hope that was given. It's symbolized by a rainbow with Abraham. We talked about last week, the covenant blessing that's symbolized by circumcision. I didn't know how else to do that other than to just draw a knife there. <laughs> there were other things I could have drawn, but I just... just decided the knife was best. Uh, with, with Moses, they're finally pulling together as a community. They're given life. They're out of slavery. How do we live? And so this covenant life that's symbolized by the, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. We'll talk about next week, Joshua and the walls of Jericho. That's a wall there and, and how that, that gave them covenant identity, retaining their identity against threat. And then David and and the theme of being a covenant leader, all, he embodies everything that's come before and is a foreshadowing of what will come in Jesus. And that's the Ark of the Covenant that housed the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of the law. And then ultimately, it all leads to Jesus. And the cross, of course, being the symbol, the sign of the new covenant. And Jesus is leading us all back to the garden, all back to God's covenant pattern. This is such a wonderful way for us to understand how God is working where God is leading us, and that God is not slow, but God is patient, deliberate, and he wants us to be a part of this journey. God's covenant through the law with Moses, the Ten Commandments, you can see the symbols there. It was a gift to those slaves, wasn't it, who didn't have life. 
They didn't have any identity. They didn't have any dignity. And so God is infusing dignity in them. He's giving them destiny and purpose that they didn't have. Maybe you can connect with that. God, in other words, was recreating them. Not just as individuals, but as a new, God's new community. Not just any old group of people gathered together. And so, it's really significant. When you look at two verses in the text we read in Exodus, I want to point out something that's really significant for them and for us. In, in Exodus 24, verse 16, and then verse 18, it goes like this. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai for six days. Start making a connection here with creation, guys. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. On the seventh day, the Lord called it to Moses from within the cloud. Six days, something was happening, and then it God shows up on the seventh day. What happened at creation? God spent six days creating. And then he sat back and saw this new creation and declared, it is good. And then in verse 18, it goes on. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain. He stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Remember, Noah was adrift for 40 days and 40 nights, and then a new covenant, something new was happening. Remember, Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and then something new happened through him. What do these six days, seventh day, 40 days, 40 nights mean? It means very simply that God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. They've been slaves seven days a week. Seven, imagine that, you never get a day off. And so the giving of the law was not a way of diminishing their rights, not a way of suppressing them. So you have a Sabbath day. You are demanded, you are commanded to rest one day a week. That was a gift of life to these slaves. And all of these commands were meant to liberate them to life. They had no rights and no dignity. And so now God is giving them rights and responsibilities. We have a teenager And you know, with teenagers, one of the things they like is to be responsible. Like, I can do this. You know, I have rights and I am in charge. And, you know, that's a way of growing up and maturing, of being human. And God recognizes this. And these people have never had any rights and given no responsibility on their own to care for themselves. They've just been enslaved. They're animals. Human doings, not human beings. No identity, no life of worth, and now they're given not just an identity, a covenant identity. They're God's special people, given divine worth, a communal life defined by God, not pieced together by what they could produce in building pyramids. Anybody like Frankenstein? The old Frankenstein movies. I remember as a kid watching all the black and white Frankenstein stuff, and and, uh, maybe you've seen the Bride of Frankenstein movie. And it's, it's the story where they're chasing the monster. He's been pieced together, as we know, from Dr. Frankenstein. They're after him. He's going through the woods. He stumbles upon a little shack in the middle of the woods. And there's a little blind man who's been on his knees praying to God for a friend. He's blind. The monster comes to his door. And unlike everyone else who's out to kill the monster, he can't see him, so he's not afraid. He welcomes him in, and the scene goes on where Frankenstein is sitting at table with him, and I think I have a picture of that. And he's singing to the monster, and he's calling him his friend. He says, I'm blind, and of course, Frankenstein can't speak. They both have an affliction, and so they can compliment one another, and they befriend one another. They share food. They sing songs together. And slowly, the monster becomes more human. And he starts to repeat words like good and food and friend. He's being humanized. That was the case for those Hebrew slaves. They've been stitched together by Pharaoh, their own Dr. Frankenstein, made into monsters. And God was about redeeming them. They didn't have wholeness. They didn't have purpose, dignity, worth, humanness. And maybe you and I can relate to that because we're often stitched together aren't we by what other people want us to be what society says we should be like maybe the inner voices say we should be like 
maybe the voices that come from our past, from our family, from our schools, from vocations that have shaped us or misshaped us, from media, from our culture, again and again and again. But we have to go back to the source of God's promises of what they could be and what we can be. See, God's, all God's promises, all God's covenants lead to Jesus who recreates you, who's humanizing you, bringing wholeness where there's brokenness, mending what was shattered. I love the way Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. That's the promise that comes to life in Christ Jesus. That's what we cling to. Your life is given by Christ, defined by Jesus, whose goal is to make you a new creation. Do you believe that? His goal is to make you whole, to make you fulfilled, to make you alive, to ignite your life in God, to bring alive the image of God in you that's suppressed because of all the images we place upon ourselves and others place upon us, to connect you to a meaningful relationship with God, with others in the world, and with one another in the body of Christ. That's what he started to do with these Hebrew slaves. It started with Moses and the promise making, the covenant making with Moses. The covenant life began with him and it is now assured for us because of Jesus Christ. It's sealed by the blood of Christ, by the empty tomb. He puts us together, you and me, here and now as the body of Christ. He puts us together. We come alive in and through and because of him. Here's the way Paul put it in Galatians. He said, speaking of himself, he said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Like Frankenstein coming alive because of this man's friendship. And Paul went on to say in Ephesians, the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. This is the first time in history that these opposing groups who were different tribes, who hated one another, who thought one was better than the other, are being brought together and given new life in Christ, made one body. And that's the story for you and me. And then the crown jewel. The crown jewel is in 1 Peter, where God, he gives us this amazing gift of life and identity. Listen to what he says. You, you are a chosen people, chosen people by God, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Think about that. God chose you. Not only did God choose you, God imputes his royalty in you. God calls you his special possession. God infused his holiness in you and me. We didn't do anything to deserve it. We didn't earn it. But this is the gift of God, the promise of God to come alive as he designed us to. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, some of you, um, you've heard me talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a Lutheran pastor in Nazi Germany. He actually led a resistance, an underground resistance, and a plot to actually assassinate Hitler. He was caught and was imprisoned in a concentration camp. He was killed, hung on the gallows just a day before the Allies came to liberate his concentration camp. And he wrote a book called Life Together. It is a wonderful little book where he's reflecting on what it means to live together as covenant people in the community of faith and why we need one another, how God has worked to put us together, to bind us together. And this is a little snippet of what he says in his book, Life Together. He says, therefore, let him who until now has had the privilege of living a common Christian life with other Christians, praise God's grace from the bottom of his heart. Let him thank God on his knees and declare it is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brethren. It's nothing but grace. And we respond out of acknowledging that. There's an interesting survey that was done by the American Psychiatric Association of 11 major orchestras, symphony orchestras, 
And uh, th- what they did was they asked them their opinions of people in other musical sections in the orchestra. And a quite funny thing came out of this. Th- this was the opinion. And these are, these are world-class orchestras, 11 of them. And this is what they said. The percussionists were viewed as insensitive, unintelligent, and hard of hearing, yet fun-loving. String players were seen as arrogant, stuffy, and unathletic. <laughs> the orchestra members overwhelmingly chose loud as the primary ad- adjective to describe the brass players. Woodwind players seemed to be held in the highest esteem, described as quiet and meticulous, though a bit egotistical. <laughs> and so they began to wonder, how is it that people who had such low view of others sitting around in that orchestra, how can they make such beautiful music be so harmonious together? And the conclusion was very simply this. They suppressed their view and their feeling of one another, and they did one thing all together. They all focused on the conductor. They all suppressed all of that and let the conductor unify them, bring to life beautiful music through them. And there's a word in there for us, guys. In the body of Christ, what we call the church, what matters most is not how you feel about someone, guys, but rather how closely you follow our conductor, Jesus Christ. Not me, Jesus Christ. It's not about what we make of ourselves. It's about what God is wanting to make of us. And dare we stand in his divine way, his sovereign way. God knows, you see, God knows our selfish tendencies. Listen to this. And I'm putting myself right in the crosshairs. God knows our selfish tendencies to pick and to choose and to be petty and to be catty and to have little tribes and little cliques here and there. God knows this. And God knows that we need a conductor because we can't get it together ourselves. We need a conductor to make covenant life truly life-giving. That's what we're about here. Let me remind you, what happened when Moses descended from the mountain? You know, I mean, there's this amazing promise. It's been 400 years. Whoa, yes, here we go. A new start. He's just been gone 40 days. Kids were just at the store for a few minutes. Keep it together. Come home. And what happened? The neighborhood is having a party. They fell apart. They made a golden calf. It was utter chaos. Get it? Utter chaos. A calf. <laughs> You guys, come on now, wake up. (laughs) Well, let me just, here's what happened. Before he goes up the mountain, he gets them to pledge. They're going to be good. Exodus 24, verse 7. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. And they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. We promise. 40 days, 40 nights, come back. And they are going nuts. And here's how it reads. Exodus 32, 7 through 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Egypt. Suddenly, it's not Yahweh who's getting the credit for delivering them from the hands of Pharaoh. It's these little calves that they've made out of gold. They've melted and they formed them out of gold. And they're, they're bowing and sacrificing to these little calves. And my friends, that is a part of the human temptation for us because God gives us a covenant with a conductor. You know why? Because we tend to make idols. We tend to make idols of the life we alone create. We do. That's the human situation. We think we can control it. We think we know what's best. And suddenly it's a calf right in front of us. We idolize the life, our life, making what we want of it instead of what God wants of it. We idolize our families, making what we want of it instead of what God wants of it. Well, we have great intentions. They had good intentions. They declared their intentions. But then it didn't come out so well. We idolize our friends making what we want of them instead of what God wants. We idolize, listen to this, our faith making what we want of it instead of what God wants of it. We idolize our church making what we want of it instead of what God wants of it. But we have a conductor and his name is Jesus. 
And he's the head of the church, friends. It's not me, it's not you, it's not anyone or anybody or any group. Our conductor created and recreated us for a certain quality of covenant life together. That's what began with Moses. That's what's assured for us through Jesus Christ. To choose anything less is to simply be stitched together by our own Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein. It's to choose to play your own instrument apart from the rest of the orchestra. And a lot of people are choosing that. There's a Barna survey that was done, a Barna research group. And they, they surveyed people in America asking about the importance of church in the United States. And it's waning more and more. In fact, here, here are the statistics. 49% said the church was either somewhat or very important. 51% said it is not too or not at all important. So the vast majority of people really think they're kind of in control of their own lives. Don't think it's very important at all. That's a lot of folks playing their own instruments by themselves and stitching their own lives together. And God simply says, I'm offering you a better way. That's what the story is all about. That's what these covenants are all about. These promises are all about. I'm offering you a better way. There was a guy in uh, the 1950s, a guy named Joseph Duran. Joseph Duran was a uh, <clears throat> guru for AT&T. He was the quality assurance man and in the 1950s, Japan was having a big PR problem, and uh, all the products were seen to be inferior that came out of Japan. So they hired him to come and to teach them about quality assurance. And he taught them this thing called the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule goes like this. 80% of outcomes are traced to 20% of causes. In other words, if you just focus on a, a few things, it will affect a much bigger picture. And, and what he said really has a connection for us and what we're learning with God's covenants. And, and you know, God just says, you just, just, just take these two tablets, these 10 things, and I'm gonna give you life. Just do this one little bit. You see, the moral of this story for us is this. God is saying, get a few things right and you'll solve most of your problems. If we get this idea of who God is and how God works and trust that God is in control and just get this covenant, this promise making and live according to God's design, let him come alive in us. It's not gonna make all your problems go away, but guess what? It'll solve the way we view problems. We'll be seeing things through God's eyes. God will, as we sang earlier, draw us closer to his heart and our hearts will suddenly look a lot more like his. Get this covenant life right. And most things will fall into place, God says. Covenant life, in other words, is God's quality assurance for your life and mine, for our life together. Covenant life embraces a shared faith and identity. Covenant life embraces a shared purpose and priorities. Covenant life embraces shared joys and burdens. We're not meant to go it on our own. Covenant life together embraces shared food and friendship. Why are we having this... this uh, covered dish next week because, you know, we enjoy one another. We share together. We're in covenant with God and one another. Covenant life embraces shared passions and prayers. We need prayers for one another. Covenant life embraces shared authority with one conductor, Jesus Christ. Covenant life embraces a shared covenant, my friends, that will never, ever end. That's the promise of God. Whether you feel it, know it, believe it, live by it because we can trust him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you that you are a trustworthy God. We thank you for being the God who came to us in Jesus, who embodied all the covenants that came before him, who sealed 